welcome everybody and thanks for uh, for coming to the next uh, edition of uh, Coffee with Cow, uh, the Director's Cut, which is a podcast uh, developed by Learn International. We're a provider based in Ireland. Uh, the idea of the uh, podcast is to bring together uh, various different stakeholders from uh, the international education sector and um, to share our thoughts and our feelings and what is happening in relation to the COVID-19 crisis, how that's affecting our, us in the immediate and what we think the new normal is going to look like once uh, once we're past COVID, whatever that looks like. And then also just to hear a little bit about uh, the different stories of the people that are guests on the show. We have three different levels. We, we talk with students and we look for their individual experiences and how it's shaped their life uh, after post, post study abroad. We talk with faculty that we've worked with and that have worked with other providers and other universities to develop study abroad programs and to allow them a, a, an amount of time to, to talk a little bit about their frustrations and did their vision come to, to fruition and you know what are their thoughts on, on the, the potential for study abroad in terms of a life-changing experience for students. And then we also talk in this subsection of it, in the director's cut, um, to administrators, senior administrators, directors, assistant directors of international global education offices and get their thoughts on what's happening right now and what they think is going to happen in the future. So uh, I would like to uh, welcome our, our guest today, um, Heather Scheman, which is Assistant Director of, uh, of Study Abroad in, in Dayton University. Uh, thanks so much for being with us, uh, Heather. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris, for having me. Splendid. So I was looking um, a little bit at your background and uh, it seems that, you know, it's funny, right? Study abroad is one of those sectors that people seem to just fall into, you know, and it's like, well, I didn't plan to do this. I mean, I didn't plan to do this or start learning international, those types of things, and that's it. But then I look at your background and I'm thinking, this is somebody who has always wanted to be in study abroad. It's evident, you know, there's this <laughs> graduate intern in, in NKU, graduate intern in, in University of Cincinnati, graduate intern in Dayton, master's in Dayton, you know, and then working your way up throughout the office. So, you know, are you an exception to the rule? <laughs> I would actually say I'm not an exception to the rule, okay. but it's flattering to think that I might be. Um, mm -hmm. So my original degree was middle school education. I was supposed to be teaching history and English, to you know, twelve-year-olds roughly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I knew going into university that I wanted to study abroad. I grew up watching travel shows with my parents, mm -hmm. but my family never traveled very far outside of Ohio. So I had seen all these images of Europe and other places around the world, but had never had anyone in my life actually go visit them. So my plan to study abroad was solely out of defiance because I wanted to do something that nobody else had, and I wanted to kind of step out of my family's comfort zone and prove that I could do it myself. Um, so I was one of those students who didn't necessarily care what courses I took. I wanted the experience, not necessarily specific academics, but I learned so much about myself and I fell in love with it um, that I couldn't stop after the first time that I had studied abroad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I love the way you're talking about that defiant piece. I, I can kind of empathize with that. It's the same, you know, it's funny how people and families are in one cohesive unit, but are very different individual people. And, um, you know, the kind of the, the black sheep of the family type thing, you know, they're always off and doing those things. So I empathize with that for sure. The defiant entry into study abroad is really interesting. Um, and then that, that, you know, sowing the seed of the wanderlust, you know, and I think almost everybody has that point where, you know, if you have wanderlust, you can almost go back to it and remember the time where it's like, uh oh, and you know you're 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 falling over a certain thing, and there's no way back. Um, and, exactly. and and that's certainly I think what international educators feel, and we try to promote that uh, to students and to anybody who will listen and stand still long enough to to, to listen. But um, so tell us then, like let's just look at those those interns, right? What I'm what I'm interested about, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of subtopics for this podcast is is to, to give a little bit of guidance for say the next generation that's looking at coming in. Uh, to being the next Heather at, at the University of Dayton or whoever it is, you know? And so, like, what would you imagine um, is, are the barriers at the moment to, to progression into, you know, a senior position, those types of things? What, what, exa what, what um, uh, advice would you be providing to the next generation that are, say, in their undergrad at the moment and are like, this is what I want to do? 
I think one thing that I've told some of our students that looks a little bit different moving forward compared to when I came into the field was when I started, so I started in international education working in about 2005, um, but I didn't go and get my master's degree until 2010. And at the time I was being told that I needed to shift um, the approach that I took to get into the field. So go get a master's degree and then you can settle yourself into a university. But now looking ahead at universities and looking financially what that's going to look like over the next five to eight years, mm -hmm. I'm noticing that they're not necessarily hiring at master's degree levels for entry level positions like they were when I started. Mm -hmm. So I think students are often caught between, do I continue my education to really get a good foundation of how about to go about this work? Or do you need to go straight out of undergraduate degree and take on a position. And I don't think I really have an answer yet in what's best, but it looks very different than it did 10 years ago. Mm, that's really interesting. I, you know, one of the things that we get lots of applications for, for, for people to work for us. And it, it is interesting about, um, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say the dilution, but you know, uh, over the last 10 or 15 years where an undergrad is no longer uh, the minimum standard requirement for certain things and it seems that you know that's con converse in terms of what you're saying there you know um, but one of the things that I find that's really important uh, for anybody taking any job is um, uh, you know get your stuff done ability if you know what right. I mean and yeah. so the ability you know the way that somebody is going to be viewed as um, a real positive influence within an office with as part of a team player is when they're given something and it doesn't matter what it is they take it seriously and they finish it and yeah. that's something that you know it's, it sounds so simple but uh, it's, yeah. you don't get it all that often you know um, you don't one thing that I thought was interesting, yeah. oh, sorry, when I started my master's degree, when I told them that I wanted to work in international education, it was the only person in the entire program um, who wanted that specific area within higher ed. And so many people told me in the field, you're never going to get a job in that. It's so small that they don't really hire a lot of people and it's not a growing area. Now, this was 10 years ago. And now I look at my master's degree program and the students who are coming in and there's a higher percentage of students wanting to do this type of work. And so when I started, I feel like I was fortunate because there wasn't as many people that realized that this was a profession because it was something that you used to stumble into. But I feel like now it's something that you can plan a little bit more than you had maybe a decade ago. Mm, that's interesting. I want to go back to what you were talking about there about, you know, looking ahead and, uh, you know, the financial pressures that, that, that um, colleges are, 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 are coming to, um, you know, Let's 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 say um, put COVID aside for a minute. Um, what what do you think the health of international education um, sector is looking like now? Again, putting COVID aside, um, like let's say we were talking in November last year. What would you yeah. be saying is 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 look is is the sector looking like over the next five or six or seven years? It'll be interesting. Um, I think higher education in the United States as a whole over the next five years is going to have some challenges. Um, there's a lot of research that says due to the recession in, um, that happened about 2007, there's not going to be as many 18 year olds coming into higher education over the next couple of years because people delayed having children. Um, and so there's going to be a smaller population of students who are coming in and the universities here in the United States are becoming a little bit more a different level of competitiveness in order to get students to apply to their institutions. And with raising tuition costs, there are a lot of factors where higher ed is going to be fighting basically for the same pool of students. So when you think about international education, it's a luxury in some ways for some on top of going um, and getting a college degree. So even though we're all looking at access and trying to figure out how to make it this um, available to all students, it's not something that every student originally will go to. Um, and so we have to be innovative and we have to make sure that people are aware that this isn't just for a small population, it's for anyone who walks into the university. And we also need to be able to be open to thinking about new ways of approaching it so that students feel welcome. Mm. How do you match this requirement for innovation in a market where it is it is drying up okay look not not to the extreme extent at the moment but it's it, it is it is what is happening how do you match that requirement for where does that innovation come from what does it look like how does it manifest at dayton 
how is Dayton saying, well, well you know, we are a relatively high fee institution and, you know, we're fighting for the same um, uh, pool of students that, uh, you know, maybe another state institution is, is uh, with lower fee um, uh, intake is, is also looking for. What, what are you guys doing that, that's really going to uh, be your USP? Are you talking for the higher, for the institution as a whole or an in international education? I was talking about the institution as a whole, but if you feel more, you can answer either, whatever you want to answer. Well, I would say when it comes to the institution as a whole, I'm mm -hmm. going to be honest, I'm kind of happy I don't have to be in those circles regularly. Mm -hmm. um, that's not really a conversation that I typically have to be in. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, um, in our office, we're looking at the students who are coming to us and also helping in communication and marketing um, on behalf of the university to market the opportunities we have and just show how they're unique. So why would you want to come to the University of Dayton and participate in our international programs as opposed to other schools? Because sometimes we might have something that's new that might make them decide to come our direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, what does that look like? Is it, is it, you know, your typical social media? How are you reaching people that have not already enrolled? How do you become part of that bigger conversation of should we go to this school? Should we go to that school? What are the things, the pros and cons, study abroad? You know, how, how, does, how does that, how do you click with the, with the rest of the university to deliver that message? Well, I will say, I know we're not necessarily talking about COVID-19, but I think the plans that we all had in place to be really innovative this year and to make some new changes have kind of all been moved aside to then make new changes again, since we're not going to be on campus for the summer most likely in the same capacity. Um, so we were gonna have regular student orientations every couple weeks. So students could come throughout the entire summer um, to look more into what was happening on campus as well as admitted student days in the spring term. Um, but all of those have had to move to a virtual format. So now our office is looking at how do we share programs and how do we talk to students through our computers in order to be able to tell them about the programming that we have. So it's mm. still being formulated. Not exactly sure how it's all going to work, but we're in conversation about it. Yeah, I think it seems that you know everybody across the world, really, but certainly in, in higher education, it was it was been there has been a number of weeks of of scramble, scramble, scramble. I do think that there's a, there you know. I might be, uh, uh, this might be the most popular thing, but I, I think it, it may not, in terms of interpersonal and, and um, collegiate communication, it's not as much of a stressor, I would imagine, for international education as it can be for the hospitality industry or, you know, something that's much more place-based. I think a lot of us are used to, you know, this type of communication in one way, shape or form. So, you know, in order for it to become more of a, 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 a really important tool on a day-to-day -day basis, a fundamental tool, we're, mm -hmm. we're nearly set up for it. Um, but let's, let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 then. Um, yeah. When did the reality of it hit you guys? At what point was the oh poop moment? This is actually really something that's going to change everything. Oh, that's a hard question. I would say late January. Um, we started to realize that there were some things we need to watch. Um, I think we were just like everybody else around the globe where we heard about it, but we're like, this can't have a huge impact. This is just something that's happening and it's small and didn't realize the severity of it. It wasn't until I started bringing students home for the semester and seeing that snowball effect or domino effect through every single one of my semester programs where it really started to kick in what a ma um, massive undertaking this was just for us, not just for us, but for everyone. So I first had to bring my students home from South Korea um, late January for 1st of February. And then before I knew it, I was bringing all my students home from Italy and across Europe until the point that I had to bring all 150 home over the course of less than a month. So a lot of it seemed like a whirlwind that I don't even remember because we were so busy working around the clock for health and safety and making sure everyone was okay. But now that I'm home, looking back over the experience, um, I can't fathom actually what we did in the short amount of time that we covered. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny. The, the, the... There's in so so many ways COVID-19 is such a leveler and people are having to deal with the similar situations and I wonder whether you know have you uh, I, I doubt there's probably a chance that you've had you've, you've been able to um, really look back at uh, 
really brief debrief and look back and 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 um, and uh, have you dealt with things right did you have policies in place those types of things but is there anything that's that that you can think of at the moment that you're thinking right wow you know that was something that just came out of left field and we are going to have to change x y and z from now on you know there's so many things but you know tell me a couple of things that you're that come to your mind where you're like okay this is going to change our standard operating procedures yes um i think you're correct uh, the smoke hasn't cleared enough for us to fully see the the entire picture um i think there are small things where we've realized that we had health and safety practices in line that we always believed would be really helpful and mm. ultimately they didn't do as much as we thought they would um, we relied on other things so now we look back and go well maybe we can get rid of this or that and mm -hmm. what was actually beneficial to us at the time when we've had to do something on such a large scale was one thing mm -hmm. we've really learned I also really learned that I am fortunate because the director um, in our office in our upper administrative team we worked really well together during this and I think this is a situation like this really shows how strong your team can be um, and how well you actually can work together and so over those weeks between the three of us being able to cycle through in the process of the way that we work together I'm very happy with so that's a huge lesson that I think I learned about our team that has helped us as we move to working distance because um, now that we work from home we know that we have clear communication and how we need to address things together but I think overall when it comes to policy we're gonna have to wait and look back on all the little the little things here and there what do you think um, the new normal will look like post COVID you know hopefully coming towards the end of this year or early next year or what, where, whenever that actually happens If I've learned anything over the last couple of weeks, it's that um, I can't, I can anticipate things, but I can't assume that things are going to happen a certain way because every day things are changing. So on one hand, I can sit there and say, I, you know, I would like to think that international education will look this way when mm -hmm. we come out of this, but a lot of things could change between now and next week that could alter that. So mm -hmm. I'm hopeful about a few things. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I've been thinking the most about since this has all happened, especially, especially in the last couple of weeks since I've been home, is the comparison of what's happening now with what happened actually on the very first day that I worked in international education. So my very first day working, I was with a little over 200 students. We had arrived in London and the London tube system was being bombed while we were there. It was my first day in international ed. And so I kind of came into this field in crisis um and here we are in another set of crisis but one of the things that stuck with me the most is that the students really became like they felt like they were part of the london community during that time they weren't just visitors they were part of that city they knew what they needed to do they needed to be um, vigilant and watch what was happening within the community they were looking out for one another it wasn't just the other study abroad students it was everybody and london was very united around we're gonna fight this together and we are united front. So it was really nice to see how these visiting students felt like they were part of the community. And so what I hope in international education now is since we're all addressing this at one time, is that we don't go into a community as someone from somewhere else, which I think is important, but also know that we have the same concerns and we have the same things that we're dealing with and it actually brings everybody closer together. And so if we have that commonality now and we can recognize it, then hopefully it'll be easier to kind of bring that up in the future when people go to study abroad and say that we have a lot more in common than we don't. Mm, that's really interesting. I keep uh, you know, using that phrase, the great leveler, you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about um, uh, the London bombings and how that played out. I think you know, mm -hmm. that's a really important experience to be able to share because you know those are the things that um faculty students parents you know presidents they all yeah. worry about you know it's 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 that moment that you're like oh it'll never happen it'll never happen and suddenly it's happening i remember we have a uh, a program that we work with in one of the virginia universities and uh the professor had previously gone to uh, belgium and you know um uh, when the airport was was bombed the day 
uh, after they left, I think something like that. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she still thinks about it. And it's one of those things, you know, we have those things in life where you're like, <gasps> you know, I, I remember years ago, I nearly shut the door on my little niece's fingers and it's still, uh, every time I think about it, it's just like, oh. So, you know, we all have those types of moments for whatever reasons. And uh, I, I think, not many people actually live through something like that. Could you take a couple of minutes and just explain from your memory, look, what was it like being there on the day? How did the communication flow? How did, the, how did you deal with it? Were you talking back to headquarters in the States or were you given, was it devolved to you and, and, and you just manage it and update, update them every two hours? How did it work? Yeah, so at the time there were, I believe three on-site directors um, I was a resident assistant support staff to them. Um, and then there was probably about 14 or 15 faculty. It's been a few years, but that's roughly mm -hmm. how many people were there. Mm -hmm. And it, as I said, it was the very first day of the program on site. And so I remember the executive director of the program, who is based in the United States, usually would come to London for the first couple of days of the program, address all of the students, and then usually fly back home. And I remember him calling an emergency meeting with all of us in this boardroom on the north side of London and sitting there saying, well, this is not something we expected to happen, but we're here, you know, but keeping a very calm sense through the whole thing and then setting down ground rules of what this was going to look like for the rest of the summer. Because even though um, the bombings had happened on, I think it was the 7th of July, um, nobody knew if it was going to happen again and we were supposed to be there until mid-August. There actually was an attempt later um, in the summer. It, they weren't successful, but I remember when that happened, all of those procedures and all of those new policies that we had put in place immediately went into action. So if we hadn't sat down and had those conversations looking ahead with the what if, if this does happen again, what are we gonna do? I can only imagine how stressful it would have been. Um, but they had really strong leadership who said, you know, we're not gonna take everybody home, but we're gonna be smart about this and we're gonna be transparent with students. And so we had a large meeting. It was actually part of orientation where we addressed this and what we needed them to do because they were adults and they were part of this program. And we very much stressed to them. They were also part of the community. And so this is what we needed them to do. And also we wanted to be transparent that they could come talk to us if they were feeling any concern or worry or if they needed anything extra through the process as well. Mm. That's interesting. I, I, I really like um, how you've explained that. I, I, I think it really highlights in a, in a very concise period the, the requirement for what I was talking about earlier, which is, you know, kind of um, unpacking what happened and how do we do it better next time? Because I think that's the essence of risk management is that you put in, in place best practice relative to everything that's happened in all of humanity up to this point in time. And we do our best to mitigate against the biggest risks. And uh, nobody can mitigate everything, you know. We can be swept away by a bus any moment, you know. That's just one of those things in life. Um, but you know, you play you play it off. And then once something happens that's totally unforeseen, you look mm -hmm. at how the team managed um, and you know, how how could we have done better and those types of things, um, and, mm -hmm. and then put those processes in place. Um, so it's really interesting to see that you know. Was there any students that said, no, sorry, I'm going home? Yeah. yeah. I remember taking probably 10 or more um, to Gatwick Airport because they just wanted to fly home. And that was fine. Mm -hmm. Some of them were there only a day, two days. Some mm -hmm. of them, we talked for a while over a period of time, you know, trying to see if they wanted to stay. And after a week, mm -hmm. they just couldn't. And that's okay. And we yeah. would acknowledge that with them. Mm -hmm. We're not going to force you to do something you don't feel comfortable with. Yeah. And so... Um, yeah, so some of them came home, but some really just embraced it. And like I said, that they wanted that experience to be there still, and they weren't going to let it scare them away. And that was a message that London was sending everywhere. They had changed the tube signs to say not afraid instead of a tube um, station's name. And so our students, along with locals, were buying the T-shirts that said that and said, we're going to go through this experience and we're not going to be afraid. Um, but I think that you can mitigate fear if you're clear and you, you talk to people about what needs to be done and that they're not alone in the situation. And so I think the vast majority, if we could find them across the United States now, wherever they happen to be, would probably still say that that was a really strong experience that summer. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, you know, one of the things I, 
often comes into conversations that I have with, with partners and just friends across the states is is you know the the notion of just humanity in general and you know the um, relative unimportance again I'll probably shout for this but unimportance of nationality sexual orientation color of your skin background all of those types of things you know it becomes again this great leveler in times of stress and in times of major worry what I find is you know people reach out and help and it doesn't matter if you speak a different language and those types of things and you know we've all been that you know backpacker running around Southeast Asia or wherever it is in India South America um, with no clue what you're doing and really you should have planned better and you know all these different types of things and we've all got stories of that person who you know bought you a meal or showed you kindness when you really needed it and those types of things mm -hmm. and um, you know I, I think I really believe in karma and I think that that's the most important thing no matter who you are where you are those types of things and I think international travel and study abroad really give, puts you in a position to 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 be vulnerable and can right. put you out of your comfort zone Exactly. Um, but that's where the, the best experience and learning comes as such um, give us an example of in your travels uh, a situation where you were out of your comfort zone notwithstanding we've just talked about a bombing in London I get that's outside <laughs> of the comfort zone but you know something maybe a little bit more upbeat upbeat and out of my comfort zone I think my goal every time I travel is to put myself at least once in a space that I feel slightly out of my comfort zone. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, I feel like uh, I don't get the full experience if I'm just doing the things that are easy and casual every single time. Um, mm -hmm. I would say one of the ones that stands out the most is I spent a summer in 2012 in Zambia, um, and I'd never been any place in the world remotely similar to what it was like to be in a small rural village. Um, in that part of the world. Um, and I had taken 12 students with me and I was the person leading the program, but I was leading having never been there myself. And I know how important it is to process what, what you're going through and what you're seeing and being out of your comfort zone with students. But I also found it was really hard, not only because of all the things that I was dealing with and trying to process myself, but I was more out of my comfort zone because I didn't have anyone to process it with myself. I had to process it predominantly on my own so that I could be the person to process it with students. Um, mm -hmm. And so there were some parts where I could do some of it with them, but I needed to think through a lot of it before I started to pose questions to them. Mm -hmm. So it was a really, it was a huge learning curve for myself, not only in experiencing that part of the world and how beautiful and wonderful the culture is and the location and the people that I met, but mm -hmm. it was also out of my comfort zone and that I had to do a lot of it predominantly on my own um, and be able to pull from past experiences to be able to think through all the different layers of what it was like to be living there. Mm. Do you think that we um, molly coddle and uh, cotton wool students too much? I think that we can sometimes. I think we could push them a little bit harder than we do. But I also think it is extremely important to get to know your students so you can meet them where they're at. So for one person, you were holding their hand too much and for another person, you're not. And you, I really try in my work to not treat them all the same. Mm -hmm. um, if one person needs more of that one-on-one -on -one attention and to work through their paperwork and to ask the questions and you can see anxiety and stress in them, but at the same time, you can see the fact they still really wanna push through and do this. Mm. They might need a little bit more hand-holding, and that's okay. And there's other ones that never ask a question, and sometimes some of those should actually be pushed more, because why are they not asking questions? Um, and I don't think there's one answer for each student. And I think that's one thing that's hard in our field of work, because the, the larger your numbers and how many people you're working with to send, the less individualized support that you can give them. And we shouldn't just assume that they're all going into this the same way. Mm, that's interesting. What frustrates you on a day-to-day -day basis about your work? Mm. If, if anything, I don't want to assume. No, I'm sure we, we all have frustrations in some way. Um, overarching, the biggest frustration is I wish that I could ensure that everybody could have the type of experience that I think um, can come from an international experience and also the type of thing that 
um, we know that would be best for them in the end. And I have to remember and put myself in check sometimes that not everybody's going to be going into this the same way that I did when I was 20 years old. Um, mm -hmm. I would want them to. It changed my life. I'm one of those, obviously, since I work in the field. It changed my life in drastic ways. And I think my frustration is there is a population of students who this is just an opportunity to go on an academic vacation. And I hate saying that in our field. It just makes me cringe. But mm. we all know that there's a population of people who do that. So my frustration is how do we get the mindset of those people to shift so that they can still get those pieces that they take home with them that they weren't expecting. Um, and so the hard part is, is you don't always know if that's happened. Sometimes it's years down the road when it actually clicks that that was a life-changing experience or altered the way that they saw their lives. And mm. so we just have to have faith that it's changing, but it's frustrating. Yeah, yeah I get it. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's those, uh, so many different decisions going to um, what we do. You know, you're going in to uh, make a decision and where to go for your holiday is a, is a different yeah. decision, you know, um, whereas this is an educational experience and there are so many different people feeding into it. People won't actually be taking the experience, but are feeding into it. And sometimes, you know, maybe uh, a parent or a guardian's misgiving or, or, or misunderstanding or perception of a, of a location will stop a student. Um, and they can be really frustrating, I think, at times. And who are you to step in and say, well, you know, mom or dad are wrong. <laughs> you know, that's, right. that's, that's a Especially little tricky. Mom and dad yeah. are often paying for the program. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 There, therein lies the, the issue, you know, and, and where, where, at what stage does the ethical, you know, where do the ethics lie at that stage, you know, institutionally and personally and that type of thing. So let's talk personally a little bit about how has COVID-19 affected you personally? I would say it's, it's similar to a lot of my other questions where I think the full degree of how it's going to affect me is really going to show up or the coming months and years of my mm -hmm. life. Um, there's a couple of small things that I notice now. So I've been working from home for a little over a month now. Um, and so it's been really interesting because I live by myself in the city with my closest family being about 35, 40 minutes away. And so I, I talk to my friends who have small children at home or houses where they're trying to do distance grade school teaching and all of this. And my house is very quiet and I'm not someone who stays home very often. I'm very social, I'm very busy, I'm out in the community, and for lack of a better way to put it, being locked in my house has been a challenge um, mm -hmm. and has forced me to slow down and be present with my own thoughts, for lack of a better way to put that. So um, for the most part, it's done well, um, trying to find alternative ways to reach out and keep community and connection with people. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not just in my house by myself in the quiet. Yeah. Um, the other big thing I think is I am somebody who looks ahead and is a planner. So I like to be able to look at all the scenarios that possibly could happen so that I'm prepared. Um, and I want to know what direction I'm heading um, and making decisions around what makes the most sense. And I can't make a decision or see anything more than about 24 hours ahead of me. And so I'm trying to embrace that and say, I'm just going to put my hands up in the air and see what happens in the world and not think ahead. And it, very relaxing once you get past that initial shock. <laughs> if you were Irish, you'd be saying sure for the grand. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny, my, my wife is uh, from New York and I'm from Ireland and um, she's the same as you. Uh, she is a planner through and through. I find that a lot, particularly in East States, but across America in general, I mean, I guess you don't have a society of whatever, three to 400 million people without, you know, more organization than, you know, most Irish over here rambling around, but no, I, I mean being facetious, obviously. But um, she says the same thing, and that that's you know from a from a mental health perspective, it's just another stressor that you have to deal with, and you have to shift and pivot and and just decide that you're going to be okay with not knowing. And it's very easy for me to say that because I am totally flippant. I'm like, yep, yeah, grand, okay, we're doing this. No, we're doing this. That's fine, you know. And to my dear wife you know she has the patience of a saint because you know she'll wake up in the morning and i say we're off doing this and you know uh there's no plans going into it at all so you know i think i can understand i don't empathize because i just don't work that way but i understand uh i think the pressures that that that, that has but i think um 
you know, how do you then, so you've, you've managed to get to the other side of that and mm -hmm. or there, thereabouts. Um, so what do you do on a daily basis then to, to stay positive in a sense when you're within a situation that we have no idea how long this is going to last and, and those types of things. What, what's your, what, what's your, you know, little two cents of wisdom for us all? I think I've learned the best way to stay positive is to only focus on today. Um, mm -hmm. There's a member of the University of Dayton community who kind of coined the phrase, be where your feet are. And so she says oh. that to our students often, just be where your feet are. And it's become kind of this phrase that students, alumni, faculty, staff use regularly. Yeah. Um, and so I'm trying to really embody that. What is today? You know, I am safe. My family and friends are safe and healthy. My work is still moving forward and busy. Um, I'm fortunate um, and we will see what happens tomorrow. Um, I can't say that it works every day. Um, we, I found I can structure my Monday through Friday really well because I still have work. And then on weekends, I make myself have set goals. You know, I'm doing the same goals that most of other people are deep cleaning houses and cooking recipes I've never made before. Um, but last <laughs> Friday, yeah, trying to do what I can. Um, my neighbors and I are trying new recipes and we will put it in a Tupperware and drop off sampling on everybody's porches. So we have this kind of random food drop that we're doing, which is really fun. Um, so we keep passing fantastic. things back and forth. Yeah. What, was your last, what was your last recipe? Um, so I love to make cakes and I was having a really hard time over the weekend. So this wasn't a new recipe, but I just pulled everything out of the cabinet and I made two very large Easter cakes and put them on my neighbor's porches. And there's only one or two people in each house and they wrote me with a big thanks and then laughed and said, now we have to eat all this cake ourselves. But you know, that's not <laughs> what we need in quarantine, but we appreciate you. So, you know, I'm not going to make the desserts for myself, but I'll make it for my neighbors. Oh, uh, that's, um, and I that's got risotto and in response on my front porch so excellent yes <laughs> it, you know the all of these types of things are so so there, there are ways of interacting without actually interpersonally in the same room interacting i think it's great myself and and uh, three of the guys that i grew up with um every sunday uh, we sit down at 8 30 or was it saturday i can't remember inevitably there's a message that goes around and reminds us um and we spend about an hour just on whatsapp in the group just chatting about whatever and it's great because we actually are speaking way more often than we would yeah. have usually you know um Same. and uh yeah it's it, it, you know the, again it's about the silver lining with these things yeah, and, and sure. uh, the time that we have you know um my, uh, so personally my family my heritage my background is basically half irish half german um mm. but my german family is still actually living in germany and I only see them every two to three years. And though they love technology, they don't do social media and they don't do video chat typically or any of that. So we'll send emails every once in a while, a phone call. But on Easter, they got the whole family around a Zoom call. And so my mom in her house and myself in mine and all of my German Schiemann family was in one room. And we hadn't actually talked to each other that way in a long time. And they actually admitted, we should do this more often. So it's nice. Um, to be able to connect with people more regularly um, because of this. Yeah, it is. And I think it's important for us to, to focus on those positive pieces that were non-existent before, and hopefully that they will stay with us on, out the other side of it. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the, the um, cynic in me says that it'll be, it'll be quick forgotten. I hope I hope it won't, but I think ultimately it's like how we're all dealing with COVID at the moment. It's, it's like the responsibility is on the individual citizen here. I'm very proud of how Ireland has dealt with it and how in general the public has, you know, 99.9% .9 doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and so, you know, that's a great thing to see um, and everybody taking their own personal responsibility. But then further on, once it's not kind of forced on us, we all then have our own, um, I suppose, decision to make as to whether you know, we look at it and take the value out of it that we wouldn't have taken before. I know personally, I, you know, one of my real goals going through this is not to be the same person the other side of it than when I was uh, going into it, you know. But uh, just a couple more questions, if, if that's yeah, okay. of course. If you had one message for your 20-year-old you, what would it be? 20-year-old me was saving every penny she could find so she could study abroad when she turned 21. 
And so I would say just keep moving forward. The plans that I had in place or were hoping would come true ultimately shifted and changed my whole life. So my 20 year old me was on a pretty good track and I am proud of her. Oh, that is what a great answer. I love it. Uh, lastly, um, yeah. which superhero would you be? Hmm. So I'm not going to probably give you the answer you like. So I, I've never followed superheroes ever. I can barely even name many of them. I know there's like Superman and Spider-Man and things like that, but I don't know anything about them. Um, I've never really been someone who's like looked up to people who are famous or any mm -hmm. of that sense. At the end of the day, they're just regular people. Um, mm -hmm. So if you always say you strive, what do you strive to be? I would say for myself, I think anybody who at the end of their life can say they had like a very full, happy life in which they know they changed the lives of a few other people, those are superheroes. Like that's all I really want. So the rest of them are fun cartoons to watch. That's fantastic. I love it. That is brilliant. Um, well, look, you know, thanks so much. I mean, we've, we've, we've talked for, for quite a long time and we've, we've been all over the map, literally um, and figuratively. And I really appreciate your, your time and, and for, for, uh, for speaking to us about this. It's a stressful time. And I think conversations like this, you know, um, even though we're talking about things that are in common with a lot of people, sometimes the ability for people to listen and say, yeah, I'm feeling the same thing. And, you know, is, it, it can it'd be helpful. And I'm hoping that that's what, uh, you know, in part this, this podcast can do for folks out there. So, so Heather Schiemann, Assistant Director of Study Abroad at Dayton University, um, I'd like to thank you. And um, I'd also like to thank our listeners uh, for staying with us again. And um, uh, tune in again when we have, I don't know who is going to be, but, uh, you know, next week we will have, we will have somebody else um, from within the industry, either in the States or internationally, um, talking about how COVID is, is uh, affecting them. Uh, so from uh, myself, Chris Lawler, CEO of Learn International, um, uh, thanks to everybody. Um, stay home, stay safe and be kind. Thanks so much, Chris.